SaaS Insiders, welcome to this episode of our show. Today we have quite a special guest. Today I'm joined by Sydney Davis. She's a founder of Nixcode. She's a TEDx speaker and just a masterful entrepreneur. And today we're going to learn a bit more about her entrepreneurial journey, specifically about SaaS. What are the learnings? What is the experience that she can share with us to help aspiring founders to overcome some of the challenges early on? With that said, Sydney, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Could you give to our audience maybe in one or two sentences the introduction to who Sydney is and what is what is your mission in this in this journey? Yeah, I'm Sydney. I I am an innovator and a no code app warrior. You know, I built a software to help fulfill my mission of seeing more non-technical people get into the tech space. We know there's a gap that exists and it mostly exists because of lack of resources and, cap- and technical capability. So I created a software, but also my personal mission is to close that gap. Sydney, one interesting question that a lot of SaaS insiders have is there are, there are quite a few no-code solutions out there. It is not like the first concept that has been introduced in the market like today, right? It's been, right. Ex- people have been experimenting with that. So and I know there is a competition for it at this stage already. So I think the question that is interesting is how do you cut through the noise when you are competing in the industry that has similar products and how do you di- differentiate your offer? How do you stand out with Nixcode? Yeah, I think that's a common thing around quite a bit of our SaaS. I think everyone has their preferred solution in the no-code space. What I, and I'll just say my journey, I did start off just the same as everybody else. like. Build no code, build a product. And, you know, as more of results in traffic, I've seen leave other builders that come to me start to really help me identify that it's more than just building with no code to people. What helped me actually stand out, break through the market, and like be a preferred choice over maybe other comparable solutions was me really offering strategy. Because we're in a space, people are not technical. That doesn't just stop at coding. It stops at the way they think. To do no code sometimes still require people to be critical thinkers, logical thinkers, engineering mindset. And people still lack that as well. They were saying, hey, these other tools still require me to be pretty knowledgeable. But for some, you know, because you, when I say you, me as a founder, people wanted to go on a call with me. They found my help and support helpful with my tool. Because I'm so, you know, small startup right now, I can intimately help. That's why people chose me. They want that intimate help. But when I started to grow and get my traction, I said, you know what? I need to find a way to take Sydney and her mindset, the way she thinks, because my discipline background is actually engineering. I'm a chemical engineer trained and self-taught developer. I said, I got to put myself in AI form. And that's what we did. We did a AI, AI product that tells you exactly how to put in some inputs and output here is a whole app site map for how to put together your idea using no code. And like, we had like a 33,000 MRR that one month, right? And that's kind of what helped us kind of rocket ship through that segment was people were like, okay, not only are you going to have the tools for me to build, but this platform tells me how to build it once I build it and get it to market. They're going to support me through their dashboard and their AI technology and machine learning to help me continuously make improvements. Like, I don't need a product builder. I need a CTO in virtual form. Um, And so that's our differentiator. And that's how we stand out. It's not a a next software in your tech stack. It's, you know, a way to have the same value a CTO would give you technically in no code form. Now, what you said is like, is groundbreaking. And I hope SaaS Insiders pick this up. It's, you're not only giving your users like the tools, like the ship, you know, like a pirate ship when they go for, for treasure hunting, you're not only giving them the ship, you also give them the map. Because yes. without the map, it's like, where do we go? Like, what's Just going on? around? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So instead of uh, just giving the tools, you also give them the the way to use them, right? And you said you, you're go, you're leveraging AI to multiply yourself because AI, you're just buying more RAM, more computing power, and it's, and it's infinite. Yes, you know, and sometimes these softwares rely on communities of experts, like. Canva relies on community designers. Sometimes people rely on communities that people know their tool to help. And the goal of SaaS is to be able to self-service help themselves. And as a startup, it's also super hard to like build community and people who just like are fan about your product and like want to learn it. And 
they didn't have the time and capacity to help other people. And you can't really rely on that. So I thought, I mean, we're in tech, like we can build something that does the power of the community through AI, right? It can help the bandwidth of the growth of how, how fast we're growing. So that's kind of like, you know, my mindset around how to reduplicate myself and then automate that value that people are getting from me into technical form. Fascinating. Sydney, speaking about automation, right? You've mentioned that you have a technical background. You're all about replicating yourself, creating a digital version of you. We know you're big about streamlining your processes and making sure it's duplicatable. Like you said, you started small, more intimate, but you know when you scale, you have to have processes in place, have some SOPs to make sure you can duplicate this, right? You can scale. From, from your experience working on Nixcode, what is the most important area to work on when you work on the business, not in the business? And maybe I could explain a bit on the question. What I'm saying is not in the operation side of things, but what are the things you need to create in terms of infrastructure in your business? What are the most critical pieces that you found helped you scale Nixcode? One of the critical, so I'm trying to think not operations based, but I'll just say some things that were critical to me were streamlining anything that was around generating revenue. So I always prioritize revenue generating activities and making sure it's automated, which should not be complicated, is for people to buy, like to give you their money. That should not be hard um, and be a hassle. Um, and that's obviously critical. So that was one thing to get streamlined and perfected. But then also like choosing the way I organize and manage all the moving pieces for people in my SaaS platform. And so uh, for me, it was finding a really core CRM and then streamlining operations and connecting my systems and tools in that. That could be like your intercom, your mix panel, um, whatever your landing page, your MailChimp or all those tools streamlining so that as a leader, I have a good snapshot about what's happening, where my lead's coming from, my growth, setting my KPIs, managing my OKRs so that whoever is working in the business day to day, if they're doing what they're supposed to do or not, like as a leader, I have an overview of my stats and can start making informed decision based on data. That is probably one of the systems and processes is streamlining my overall CRM from lead man customer acquisition management, if you will call it that way. Um, and then secondarily, it's like, I made sure if any process was done first, it's the process to pay. That that is one thing that is set up to do that. Once you get in there, like, how do I buy it? And that's clear and that should work well, be streamlined. Now, what you said is extremely important to a lot of the technical founders, to have that technical background, because I'm an engineer in the past myself. And what we tend to do uh, with our experience is let me focus on this complicated things in my product, right? If I make my product great, if I introduce 1000 features, people will just buy, you know, like, but what's your buying process? Well, I don't know. I guess they need to message me and I need to send them something, right? So that's yeah. uh, what I find is a lot of times technical founders, they, they find themselves stuck in the details and the technical details, not so much about, hey, let me build the buying process first to make sure it's easy. And then we'll figure out what to do next, right? Let, let, let them pay first, then we'll see what we can do. So yeah, that's, uh, I'm a, I pleasure with that. I'm a huge proponent of um, not build it and they will come, but once they pay for it, then go build it or go do it. Um, and sometimes we work backwards. We spend a lot of time building product or building that course or creating this challenge and or adding these additional features that no one even said that they wanted. And maybe they said it, but no one's put in any investment to say, I'm willing to buy, pay for it and buy it. Um, and so, and I've made those mistakes before in other startups. Like, you know, I put all this time in, created something beautiful and gorgeous. I think, you know, people want or are saying that they want, because that's what they were saying on Facebook, right? Where you put it out there and then you pull out your sales page and no one signs up and pays for it. You know, but you put this time in, right? And so it's like enough of doing that here's what I'm going to do and I'm going to offer and I can deliver, but do you want to pay for it? And if you do, that's why people do pre-sales. That's why people do wait lists and things like that. Like, you know, hold your space, show me that you have some investment and you're serious about taking action. And then I will go do, right? And so that's kind of how I've worked too in my SaaS model before I even build new features. I have a whole product roadmap, but nothing will come out until my wait list hits a certain metric, until the pre-sales hit something where someone says, hey, I'm putting money down because I want to buy this when you're ready to launch it out. And that validates 
people will buy what you want. I will go take that and go do it. But until then, I'm not doing it off of, that's cool. I think I would like that. That's, you know, something that's been priority for me in terms of buying is important, but also like when to move based on when people to choose to make that purchase from you. Now, I applaud you on this specifically, as I said, because I see a lot of this being implemented in the coaching and selling information space, where, for example, they want to test a course, they first create mm-hmm. an offer, and if they make sales, then they create the content, the schedule. But I rarely see this being implemented in SaaS. And, and, and sometimes SaaS insiders have this problem that let me just build those features because people said they really want them, you know, and then, and then they roll them out and they're like, Get, would you like to buy it? No, right? So it's like- Yeah, or not said, right now. Yeah, yeah. You but you said it's, it's cool. But yeah, yeah, it's cool, but just not for now, right? So it's, uh, this is something that a lot of people need to probably understand, right? So that we need to test the offer first before, before we build it because the market will tell us and the best vote they can make is vote, vote with a wallet. Meaning like if they make like a small commitment, some sort of commitment that shows us we can, there, there is a need for that. And that's 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 some fascinating things. It tells me you you, you probably have you probably have mentors, probably have advisors who who go who, who work with you on this journey because a lot of times when SaaS founders kind of like a lone wolf, they are stuck in their, in their head. Sometimes they don't get those strategies, and uh, it, it tells me you you apply them from from different industries as well. Absolutely, from experience, you know, I've also done quite a bit of accelerators with industry agnostic type, you know, mashups. So, as always, just been SaaS, but I've always been having a, a fresh perspective to see how someone else, that maybe non SaaS, has leveraged, you know, something to get conversion to boost sales or go to market. I said, you know, maybe not that way, but I could take some notes and lessons learned from that and apply it to my model. Oh yeah, that's. There are two ways to look at this, right? There's a tunnel vision, which is like, I'm doing what my competitors are doing. This is my industry. This is how it's done. Yeah. Instead of chain, channel vision. Let me see how people outside of my industry are doing it. Some weird things that are, it looks like it doesn't apply to my business, but it actually, what allows us to create this exponential growth. And yeah. I think like, th- th- this, this is something that you've been able to leverage as well from those experiences. Absolutely. Sydney, I'm personally excited to to seeing your TEDx talk that you recently did. Yeah. I know you did it. I think you did it a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah, did it, I think last Tuesday. Last Tuesday. I'm wondering, because I, I know you've, uh, you've had this goal for yourself to actually to, to be a TEDx speaker. So yeah. this definitely shows that you take seriously the personal brand as well, the, the awareness. So one yeah. topic I wanted to touch is how important is developing, first of all, the speaking skills required for this kind of, uh, speaking opportunities and secondly the personal brand are those important for SaaS founders and if so to what degree like why why would why would I choose to build my personal brand yeah so I always encourage me on the personal brand personal brand to become a, an authority in the area of where you are behind it and people always say like when investors invest in you they don't invest in your business really investing in a founder same thing with you as a personal brand. Sometimes people choose the product. I can't tell you how people choose my product because of me and who I am. And, and it's a trust factor. It's I trust your knowledge. I trust your business acumen. I trust your decision-making and how you're leading the company and building your product. So I'm going to ride with you over other products where I don't know. I don't know who's behind. I don't know. I have no insight in the direction of product roadmap where they're going, you know, how they're making decisions, what were they take into account? But because you offer so much transparency, Sydney, and, and because you seem like such an authority and you speak on things that I I need to lean into because I'm not knowledgeable, I know you put that thought and expertise into your product. And that's why people choose you. So having a personal brand, uh, one, does build a trust factor with people who knows you and not only should it be you, but your whole team, almost those of your head of marketing or whoever your, your customer support head or your operations CTO by them being authority, it builds trust. And it says, Oh my God, like your whole team, like, I love what you guys think. It's evident that not only your company culture shows within your startup is visible online, right? It carries around and that builds trust and people when they choose to use your product, people also are buying you as well as a founder in your team. Um, but having, being able to speak is really about being a great storyteller. One that helps when you're pitching or talking to investors is one telling a story. A story is going to be about your experience, telling a story from a customer's perspective. Having those skill sets 
really helps people better connect, feel inspired and find inspiration in why you're doing what you're doing. So you don't have to be, you know, big stage public speaker or anything like that, but just having great storytelling skills and engage people in a comfortable manner. So it doesn't feel like a sales, it doesn't feel like a sales pitch, it doesn't feel like a lecture or like a big educational tech download, but like just a general conversation at anyone's level, um, being able to enhance your storytelling skills and capability. And it's something I'm still learning myself, but has been great when having to speak and tell my story or pitch or talk to investors or do sales calls. Um, I might tell a story from different perspective, my own or customers, but I've nailed that way of talking and speaking and telling the story down. And it's it's been great, not only for personal brand, but ter- ter- in essentially business growth. Awesome. SaaS Insiders, I think there is a quotable phrase here from Sydney, right? Which is investors invest in you, not your product in a way that, and I can relate to this and I know it's true because We've spoke to a few VCs as well. We were interviewing them on why they invest, especially the early stage at pre-seed or seed. And at that stage, it's still unclear in terms of whether the product will work. We have some metrics, we have some traction, some sort of unit economics, but it's still it's it's still like not clear because it's still small scale. Like we only know when we scale. And at that stage, what I learned as well is the reason they invest in founders is because they know they invest in people who will figure this out. Because things might change in half a year from now, market can be totally different. But what you're investing to in people that you just trust that they are the best ones to figure out how to make it work in those conditions. So I think that's that's gold here. And the second thing so that everyone catches is facts tell and stories sell in a way that people much more relate to stories because that's how we've been transitioning information from tribal periods, right? When people from hunts go to campfire and they share the stories how they killed a lion. We just we just take it as more relatable, relatable information instead of just giving some numbers. We just digest them better. As you said, it doesn't have to be a download or technical analysis of some kind of book. Yeah. It should be, it should be more personal. That that's how we build real connections. Super cool. Uh, what's what's your next goal? You 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 are a TEDx speaker now. Like what's uh, What's the next stage? Oh, I, I really have a goal um, to personally just be on more stages and encourage more underdogs. When I think underdogs, it's the over 40, maybe I didn't go to college for tech or I felt marginalized somewhere. Like I, I'm not in Silicon Valley, nor am I in a big c- city. I'm like in this local town where we don't even do startups here, but I have an idea. I want to talk more to these the underdogs of tech, right? The non-traditional people who pursue tech um, and encourage them to take for it and jump. And also those who've been stalling on that great idea to get it done means, if, you know, if you've got a perfect product, you waited too long, uh, to go out there, make mistakes, make them fast and make them often so that you can move forward and learn and get to the the, the right solution in product market fit and finding that minimal sellable product. I know people say to get that MVP, but I say get your MSP. What can you sell first? Um, you know, and then of course, within Nick's code, We have a long product roadmap, Um, so we have a lot of great things that are coming out next year and amazing partnerships. And so I'm looking forward to more people hearing about Nick's Code, seeing us be not more than just a no-code app builder, but be like, damn, like you can actually do, you know, I can actually like run my startup in here. It's a full service suite to build my app and build my startup or, or have my whole internal team company work within this infrastructure. Super excited about the potential um, of how we're going to show up next year because we're just about two and a half years young. So, you know, going on year three with a bootstrap mm-hmm. startup, I'm, I'm just excited for what's to come next year in Nextcode. What I'm curious and a lot of SaaS insiders curious as well is now that you're on a journey of two and a half years in Nextcode, is there anything you think you would you'd do different if you were to go, go back in time where you just started? Maybe, you know, some of the things that if you did differently, you could just propel yourself, like and save like a year of experience. Uh, are any of those like not like uh, experiences, learning, um, learning curves? Yeah, experience the learning curves. So my background is not sales and marketing. I'm very much the technical CTO of my own company. So usually you find it the other way around where people usually lack a CTO. I usually lack a sales and marketing person and I'm the technical person. One thing that I would have definitely done differently is I would have done a lot more video content a lot sooner and a lot more consistently. I just started dabbling in YouTube my first year and I didn't really take it seriously because 
one thing about you know SEO and, and some marketing is it's not immediate. You don't see results for a while. Um, and now YouTube is probably one of my strong, strongest funnel, top of funnel things that gets me customers. And but I imagine just because how long it takes for that stuff to get results for you, I would have wished I would have started off a lot sooner. Just putting out content about hey, these are some things you can do in my platform, do video tutorials just talking to you about the product and just doc, just documenting the process and the journey and the tool and the product. I guess people who watch it and look for those things is great SEO. It's great instructional content. And especially when you're in a technical product or tool people to do something, they're always looking for how to, how to. And usually they prefer to see it in video form. You know, and I'm now just getting serious about it to do videos, but I, that's one thing that I wish I knew the power of video marketing and was more consistent in the beginning about creating that content. I think the user growth and self potential and attraction could have been even greater than we are today had I have done that. You know, I just didn't know what you didn't know. And, you know, I had marketing people tell me, but I was like, no one's watching, no one's viewing, you know, and I, we never ran ads. We, never did paid marketing here at Nixco. We're completely organic and we're just not getting into marketing, uh, organic, more organic marketing and uh, consistently and more paid marketing now. But that's something I really wish I would have known starting out or leaned more into or found someone else to lean into for me and outsourced if I had to prioritize like where to start. I mean, damn Sydney, if you didn't tell me that you're technical, I would never, I would never guess really. So <laughs> what it tells me is you've got a huge transformational journey through Nixco. Absolutely. It's like you're a speaker, you're inspiring people. It's like you're, you're doing all the things right. You're talking about YouTube, about personal brand. I mean, if anything, tech skills, like tech expertise, it's more like a concealed weapon for you now. No one mm -hmm. knows about it. Like you're like a visionary kind of stuff, but you also have super tech expertise so that no one can really, you know, sell you on something that you don't know about. So it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's really cool. I've got a lot of founders who are not technical when I interview them or want to talk to them, some of my friends, and I tell them, hey, you should do YouTube. You should do more content of you. Jump on another podcast, show your face. Objections I have is like, but that will tell my competitors who I am. And then like, people will know about it. And I'm like, that's great. People will know about you. So like, if, what would you say to people who are currently really passionate about the product? They're actually growing. We have a yeah. lot of people who are, like getting five, 10,000 new subscriptions per month. So they're like, they're eating users, they're eating this market share, but they still lack content. Like, do you think bumping some YouTube, some personal brand, maybe TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, do you think that will put some fuel, put some gasoline on, on their fire? Yes. Make, and, and I'm, I'm 32. I'm a little, I feel like the video thing is not my generation. I struggle like, how do I do all these fancy things? Like, don't feel like you need to start dancing and doing reels. Like, that's not it though. Like, you don't have to do the little viral dances. But leveraging the YouTube and just teach, teach. People go to the internet to learn, right? And if you could teach them how to do something or solve a problem or get something done using your tool, your product, your SaaS, that's what they're looking for. People search for long-term keywords. They're not searching for no code. Looking for how to build an app without coding, how to build an app quickly, how to build an app uh, without a CTO or how to build an app for under $10,000, right? These are things that realistically that they're looking for. And so this is the type of content you want to start creating is what do you think people are looking for? And then I'm going to do a video answering that question. Videos get SEO super well. And also why I say videos, because more people now are willing to consume content in video form. And that's the way the internet has conditioned people now. You writing out a big procedure and document about how to do something feels overwhelming versus I can just kind of fast forward and watch, you know, and get it and, and see it. Having someone talk through something and visually applying it helps people resonate and feel comfortable with applying it. So when you're creating marketing content, having not only your words match with what they're seeing and then using keywords in your video and titling and file naming to be SEO, to be found when they're searching for how to figure out something out and how to do something and how to save something, how to create something that will help you get that traction. But also that'll help them make decisions when they're comparing competitors. They're also going through YouTubes. They want to see, okay, who do I resonate and understand the most? What appears to be easier for me to achieve? Even reviews, start putting that in video. Um, if you're going to do video marketing, try to tap into other experts in tech who create videos already and say, hey, try out my product. And if you, you know, like it, do you mind like doing a video review or a video, you doing something with it? Influencer marketing, like, but video form, 
it helps people. That's how people are consuming and learning today. And you want to meet them where they're at. I'm really glad that we're recording this because that's the whole content strategy right here in, in three minutes. So we're going to transcribe it as well for SaaS and Cyrus, maybe put in some form of a blog because it's just a lot. It, it, it's just a lot of things that you've described that can really, really increase visibility, right? Because in the end of the day, unless we are inventing a time machine or a teleporting device, chances are something, someone is already doing what we're doing because it's yeah. like, it's all of the ideas is just a combination of the, of the previous, you know, advancements. And Absolutely. the whole goal right now is just to be more visible than them. Like people be aware of us when they think of something, right? So as long as we have this top of mind awareness, we're good. And in order to create that, we need to be visible for people that are looking for it. So I think that's uh, that's what us founders need to master to to achieve greatness in their business. Absolutely, I agree. I know it's um, it's a bit of a hard question, but I'm still going to ask it because I know you can you can handle it, uh, Sydney. If there was like one thing, the most important thing that SaaS founders need to know when they are getting started on their SaaS business, right? Let's say I have a background in real estate, in coaching, in selling, and I know a niche from a product, I know my audience well, I want to build a solution for them. If there was like one piece of advice for, for those SaaS founders who are getting started with their product, building their teams, systems, processes, marketing strategies, what do you think is the biggest thing they should remember? If there's only one thing they can take out of this conversation. Okay, I'm gonna try to sum this up. Across the board, team, product, strategy, all that, focus on the who, what, where, when, how that will generate revenue at, at a decent conversion. So I think you can find a couple of things that will generate revenue, but when we say increase conversion, it's, it's a volume. Um, and sometimes that may be 1%, 3%, 10% is a good sweet spot for us SaaS founders. And so out of all these things, when you're picking you know, your thing, you want to focus on sales experiments it means you're not going to find one thing and do you're going to do a series of experiments and what your focus should be is which experiment that gets people in the door and gets them to buy is converting into money and money at volume and this is essentially what comes to evolve to product market fit okay so the the the, the goal is to focus on revenue first and making sure we can handle that that the revenue generating activities first and then figure out the infrastructure is that correct so to speak, yeah, you're going to test. There's not one infrastructure that's going to work. You're going to have to do experiments yeah. Yeah. and see what works. So as far as you're going to, have to experiment with different sales and infrastructure combinations. What am I going to do? So what, what am I offering and selling, you know, and how I'm operating and what's working to get me that sales and that, that conversion. And then you'll say, hey, this infrastructure process did not get sales and oh, I'm going to nix it. And that was go, this one worked really well. And you'll start to I mean, over the time you're learning and experimenting, you'll find that one sweet spot that's like, hey, this infrastructure in top of funnel, the bottom funnel worked. I got, you know, sales. I was converting, you know, everyone that came in, I converted about 10% of them. Now let me take this and then amplify it, put some gasoline on it, put some marketing dots on it, you know, put things in more team around that. That's kind of should be the focus. Um, it's not just what makes money, but what infrastructure works to output money and at the volume mm. for you. So to experiment and to pivot quickly, to try to see what the combination works yeah. in, in the beginning. From my own experience, I spent probably way too long doing things that didn't work, thinking they were going to change. Like, oh, I just need more time. It'll change. Usually, likely it won't. You know, giving a few experiments, 60, 90 days, and then, you know, see what happens at the bottom of the funnel. And then just like they tell you to um, fire fast, do the same thing with things that don't work. Quit holding on to things that are not working because you just, I don't think time is going to change. Whatever. Fire that process, the infrastructure and model, scrap it, go to the next experiment. Um, that's the startup journey. That's what's fun about it is to learn and use that first few times to keep experimenting and trying things out. Love it. Sydney, I know there will be some of your personal fans as well watching this podcast because we'll be advertising. So I'm curious, maybe some updates. What's 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 coming out on the Sydney side and the Nix code? What are the exciting things that are coming out in the next one, two months, three months? Absolutely. So we're launching a in-app live streaming capabilities, which has been a long time goal to add video capabilities um, to our platform. So we have a really great couple of integrations happening that will allow people to um do you know tutoring, video to video, live streaming their events or live streaming other events like festivals and concerts or just, you know, type of clubhouse twist, but, you know, with audio and video. 
So we're looking forward to that in the new year. has been a long time request of people on our platform. Um, and so that is one of the things and also offering more startup pricing. So we've also had startups ask for like startup discounts. So we plan to launch a new inf pricing infrastructure specifically for startups. As for the video streaming, it really sounds like the whole new market sector will be open to it the moment you have this video. Like you said, the tutoring, I think that's, that's like the integral part for it. Yeah. That is definitely one of the pieces that will hopefully change a little bit of the infrastructure that we have, but also kind of see how that, you know, drives sales for us. Because again, we had people pay for it first to validate that they wanted it. We went and built it and now we get to launch it. Awesome. Sydney, I'm, I'm really curious and SaaS insiders are always keen to learn. You sound like a person who is constantly a student, right? To, all, to, 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 to grow, we always need to be in a student mindset to be ready to go to the next level. When it comes to your education, whether it comes to books, some influential speakers, mentors, if you were to name two to three resources that were most impactful for you for your journey in, in the past couple of years, what yeah. those resources be? Um, one would be a book called Profit First. They have one by niches. I have not seen a SaaS-based Profit First, but I, I've read the general Profit First, and I love the model. It's changing when we look at accounting to always incorporate profit into our pricing models. Second is I joined a community called Goody Nation, uh, led by Joey Womack, and it has been phenomenal with finding resources and capital and grant grants and pitch competitions and, and support and accountability as a founder. And my third resource, um, you know, Facebook. I have a really great community and I think finding community. So we talk about being a thought leader and showing up. I think not only LinkedIn is good, but Facebook, show up. Yep, yeah, get on live stream. And I encourage you guys, I'm like, oh, don't go live, but go live and talk and share expertise. Start something like, you know, just talk with me Thursdays, Founder Friday, something. It could be 15 minutes. Start showing your expertise because then people refer you, people recommend you. People are saying, hey, I'm looking for a tool that does this or I'm looking to do this. They'll tag you, they'll refer you. Start establishing your brand presence. So I think social media and specifically Facebook is an easier start to uh, creating more brand authority before moving on to more expert platforms like LinkedIn. And probably the, the goal is to keep it consistent. Not, not probably that much bursting, but more like 15 minutes, like every Friday. Yeah, every Friday, once a month. But pe people say consistency, think, oh my God, every day. Consistency is just a repetition that you said. If it's monthly, people know to expect monthly, your updates, your email, that you'll go live every first of the month. But whatever it is, be consistent. And I got to tell you how... I cannot tell you the power of consistency, which also equals discipline, has would be transformational in anybody's business. Consistently showing up, consistently delivering, consistently being available, right? Like it just shows up across your business being consistent. And especially if you do it online, you it's hard and it's not easy, but having that discipline could be pivotal. It makes people refer you, recommend you, look at you, follow you. I want to get to know you and engage you. And that could be potential clients, leads, or investors. Show up and be consistent. Not every day. Be reminded, people feel pressure when we say consistent, but whatever feels comfortable to you. But once you set that tone, maintain it. It, it shows well in the video creating sector when it comes to creating videos constantly, right? When you set a goal, I will be making three videos per week. And like, have you done videos before? It's like, no. Like, oh, it's going to be. It's not realistic. Let's, let's start with one video per week and see how you try it, right? Because yes. Yes. I said for myself when I started like two years ago, I'm going to make one video per week every Wednesday. And we actually were doing this before we switched the content model for like one and a half years. Like there wasn't a single Wednesday. It wasn't about the video. And the real struggle began probably in two months after that, because it's easier to, you know, like burst to 12 videos in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of feels like, oh, I... I don't need to do them anymore. But then as, as your bandwidth comes, you need to actually do them and do them again. And it's, um, it's, it shows that for people, it's much easier to create 10 videos per day than one video per week for, the, for, for two months. It's, yes, um, it's hard, but, but do whatever works for you. If, if you can, I mean, it takes planning to do the 10 in one day, but do whatever works for you. I also fan a batch content. I feel like expertise comes with doing that. Especially I mean, if you are like really into your product and you like know your audience, talking and creating video content becomes easy. Um, and don't feel the need to be perfect. Don't try to go out, buy that fancy mic, get a new camera lens, buying editing software and wait till your hair and your outfit together. Just show up. 
just show up and be authentic. There is power in being authentic as well. So take the pressure off and the excuses out the window that you don't have what you need to get started. The fact that people aren't watching in the beginning is perfect because you can train, you can perfect, right? While you're not unref while you're, you're unrefined, it's, it's good because no one's watching yet. So by the time they do, you already have the yeah. skills to, to actually like convey the message. So that's, that's what I learned as well, like as an objection. What are the other things you think would be beneficial for the SaaS founders, SaaS and such, the audience to kind of to wrap up this conversation? I'm curious to know what's the best way to get in touch with you for SaaS insiders, for people who also have SaaS, maybe have some collaboration opportunities. What would be the best, best place to connect with you? Sydney, maybe learn about Nick's code and just generally yeah. stay connected. <clears throat> well, on most social media, if not all of them, I am, I, my uh, tag is I am Sydney Lorraine. So you ever want to shoot me a message so we can exchange Calendly links and get on each other's calendar and talk would be great. Or, you know, sydney at nextcodeapps.com uh, is my direct email. I'm always open to collaborations and networking. What would be like the final, the wrapping, the yeah. wrapping words for our interview today? What do you think, what should be the note we should end this beautiful conversation on? Find your minimal sellable product and keep experimenting to find what fits right. Sydney Davis, everyone. Sydney, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. SaaS Insiders, we'll see you on the next episode.